What is your take on all this stuff going on at the border, Dave? I mean, we're covering it every day over and over on the room report. I mean, it is truly an invasion. It is intentional, uh, mostly by the Democrats, but the Republicans are complicit, if not also actively involved in this. And I don't know if you, mm. did you read any of the text of the deal, this bipartisan Senate deal? It's complete insanity. The deal- Oh, it's insane. The deal literally says that they will, base, that they will do nothing until it hits 5,000 people a day. So that means if 4,999 illegals come a day, so meaning they're count, they're actually counting the people that come illegally, which by definition actually makes no sense, right? But that means you could basically have 5,000 illegals come per day and it will not trigger any extra uh, protections. So we had Brock do it with his fancy calculator on his phone this morning. He multiplied 5,000 times 365 days a year. I literally oh, just wow, look at you. Thing. Wow, you really, you guys really are meant to be. Look at you, nice. you both have the calculator on your phone, incredible. That's 1.8 million people who can come illegally for sure. And that's on top of that, the rest of the system, of course, will be abused and, and manipulated and everything else. So it's a horrible deal. And as I said on the Rubin Report, and I will reiterate it here on People of the Internet, if the Republican senators, who I do still have respect for, guys like Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, et cetera, if they sign on to this thing, like I'm, I'm gonna definitely hold their feet to the fire because it's, it's awful, it's absolutely awful. Well, and just for the record, in the last three and a half years or so, over six million people have already come illegally. Yeah. So if you do the math on that, that's probably more than 5,000 people per day as it currently exists. Right. So you're barely limiting the number of people that have come in. But my dad and I were talking about this the other day with especially that one video that went mega viral last week. I know you guys posted it on Instagram of the guy getting interviewed in a man on the street oh, interview yeah. at the border. And he's like, you're going to know who I am very quickly. Turns out his identity came out and he's like an Azerbaijani terrorist activist who's been in prison for several decades for illegal arms trafficking. Lovely. Don't we love to see that? My dad was saying, imagine if even one percent of the illegals that have come across the border, that is nothing. One percent is nothing of these people that have come across the border are terrorists or are here on some sort of mission to create terror in the United States. Do the math on that. That's still like 60,000, 70,000 people that have in the last three and a half years alone come into our country with the sole aim and objective of creating terrorism from within, from destroying America from within. So it's just bonkers insane to me that we can call this a bipartisan deal on immigration. And while I was at the gym this morning, all of the TV chirons in the uh, workout area were saying that the bipartisan deal is falling apart and nobody wants to support it. Well, yeah, nobody wants to support it for a freaking reason because you're literally creating the worst nightmare scenario for the United States to even exist as a country moving forward. Right. It's just so, it's so fascinating. And when you break down the numbers the way you just did, okay, so if it's 1% of people have bad intentions, you got about 60,000 people here. That's an awful lot of people with bad intentions. But that means like, let's say 75, and I don't think this is true, but even if you were like going way out of, way out of your way to be as, you know, kind of quote unquote nice as possible. Let's say you were like, you know what, 75% of these people are absolutely spectacular people who want nothing but the best for America and of all, it still doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You cannot come here illegally. That is the greater issue rather than, okay, these people are a little mean and these guys have bad intentions and everything else. It's just either you have a country or you don't, and they are gonna usher in the return of the orange man if they don't fix this freaking thing. I'm so glad you just said that, Dave, because our next video is a whole compilation of Donald Trump being maybe the funniest person ever. We forget so much in the world of politics just how people People can be so funny. Like, I think we're always so obsessed with attacking people and discrediting them and trying to destroy their character that we forget to take things on face value. So here is Donald Trump being an absolute comedic legend for you. Oh, Don, you're a little controversial. You're talking about illegal immigration. I said it's illegal. That there are uh, for immigrants on the whole create our Come on, try getting it out. Try getting it out. I'll get it out. I mean, I don't know if you're going to put this on television, but you don't even know what you're talking about. Try getting it out. Go ahead. It's so, it's so insane. President Obama, Secretary Kerry, I highly think you should read this book quickly. Quickly! We have very stupid people in our country negotiating for us. Well, the last one's right, that's for sure. <laughs> I just 
love the clip at the beginning. I could watch that a million times in a row and still laugh. You're a little controversial. They're illegal. That's literally what we're talking about right now. Isn't it interesting? Because like his skill, you know, look, the guy's got an interesting skill set for sure, whether you agree with all of the jokes and the name calling and all that stuff, fine. But like his skill of just being able to read the room. You, you've seen him speak in person, right? I assume at some point. Mm -hmm. Many times, the, yeah. the I've only been to one actual speech that he gave. It happened to be the day that I met him for the first time. It was at a turning point thing a couple of years ago where I ended up at dinner with Junior at Mar-a-Lago and then, and then he introduced me to his dad. This was at the height of the first impeachment. It was like the week before Christmas, right when that was all going on and blah, blah, blah. But one of the things that really shifted me on him, because I really wasn't supporting him before that and then I obviously did for a re-election, uh, was watching him operate in that room. It was it was basically watching a stand-up comic just kind of figure out the rhythm of the room. And while you might say, okay, I don't want my president to be a, a stand-up comic and I want him to be able to read off the prompter and, and get every line perfectly, his strength was doing something that was making us all emote. And you know, yeah. look, as, a, as someone that obviously supported DeSantis for the last six months or so, all the competency, all of the, my policies are right or whatever, it, it didn't get people to emote. And that does, it just factually does matter whether we like it or not. It does. I talk about this all the time that I think the right has become so obsessed with the idea of the facts don't care about your feelings mantra. That is true. Like facts will always be objectively correct. Feelings are fleeting, but I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive. I wrote about this at length in my new book, which you wrote the foreword for, so you already know this, but I, I think they really do go hand in hand. We have feelings and we're supposed to emote as human beings for a reason. God created us, if you believe in that as a Jew or as a Christian or anything else, with intention to have emotions because that's what creates the humanity in us that sets us apart from other intellectual beings that can think about things. I mean, your dog can think, do I want to go inside or outside? Do I want to bark at that squirrel? Do I want to lay down or stand up? But there isn't the same amount of intellectual meets the emotional connection there that I think is so important for humanity and for leadership, whether that's political or cultural or religious or anything in between. You win over the hearts and minds of people when you're able to connect with them on that humanity level. And whether you love Donald Trump or you hate Donald Trump, it's impossible to admit that this man didn't create some sort of emotional rise in you one way or another. And I think that's just been so missing from the argument and beyond the argument, the storytelling aspect of what we want America in the future to be. There's power in a great story. There's power in laughter and comedy. There's power in feeling the depths of things. And I think we run away from that far too often because the left manipulates emotions, but they're manipulating emotions, understanding just how powerful they are and how much they can get done doing that. Yeah, I think that's a great point because, you know, the facts don't care about your feelings. Like, obviously, that was Ben Shapiro's line that kind of lit fire under, under the rise of him and ultimately kind of built the Daily Wire, actually. Well, and it's why it's important to foster both, right? It's important to teach kids, the next generation, or just people in general. These are the solid, unmovable truths about the universe that have always been and will always continue to be true. But why does it matter? How does it apply to you? I think that's where the feelings and the emotion and the storytelling aspect comes in. One cannot live without the other. And I hope and I pray the right in general continues to figure that out because they aren't mutually exclusive.